17 is where we're going to be reading. If you don't have your Bibles or your iPhones or your iPads with Bible app on them, follow along on the screen. Text is provided. We're going to read verses 8 through 15. 8 through 15. If you're there, say amen. amen. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand upon the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Moses, or excuse me, Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill and came to pass when Moses held up his hand with that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek, somebody say the enemy, the enemy enemy prevailed, but Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, and one on the one side, and one on the other side. His hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Notice verse 13, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi, which simply means the Lord is our banner or our standard of war. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for this passage, Lord, that we have come to. I ask for your grace as we share it with your people today. Lord, we need your presence. We need your help. In Jesus' name, all God's people shout amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. I've called this uh, few uh, thoughts from this passage, I'm just going to call it A nightmare out of nowhere. A nightmare out of nowhere. How many has ever had a nightmare? I, when we go to the zoo and take the kiddos, I, uh, I can't linger in front of the snakes. If I do can almost write it down. I'm going to have a nightmare about serpents that evening. How many has not only had a nightmare as far as in your sleep, but how many has actually said you've lived through a nightmare before? Had actually a living nightmare. We have no doubt all experienced a nightmarish crisis that have come out of nowhere It's a time that we're suddenly faced with a problem that uh, is impossible for us to solve. And uh, it's when that problem overwhelms us and we think, uh, this is it. There's no way out. Uh, I'm, I'm going under. Maybe a doctor has shared the results of medical tests that confirmed the presence of cancer or some other grave illness. And the prognosis that he gave caused you to walk out of his office with a wave of despair. And you think to yourself, this is it. Not going to make it. Or maybe uh, a different situation is where you realize that your marriage has reached a dead end. The fighting, the tension is so bad that you know It's not going to end well. Maybe your nightmare uh, consists of uh, or concerns finances. How many's ever been there? Yeah, the bills are growing and growing, and car is in the shop. You're struggling to feed your family. 
struggling to keep the roof over their heads. And you just have that feeling. There's no way out. I, I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe it's a child-rearing crisis where you have young teenagers and you feel hopeless in trying to direct them. You feel like quitting. Maybe it's an employment issue, a nightmare on the job. Your company is downsizing and you may be the next one they cut. Well, if any of those situations and many more describe your life, if you're facing a hopeless, impossible situation, I happen to believe you've come to the right place because this morning we're going to study some verses that tell of a time when the Hebrew people suddenly faced such a nightmare. And the way their leader, Moses, responded to that nightmare will help us learn how to face our own living nightmares. Now, to fully understand the text, we need to kind of put ourselves into Moses' shoes, or rather sandals. He and the Hebrew people are on the way to the promised land. Just a few chapters before this account, they're fresh out of Egypt, okay? And here they're on their way to the promised land, and Moses, their leader, looks up and sees a cloud of dust off in the distance on the horizon. And a closer investigation reveals that it is caused by a huge enemy army that is storming toward them. Swords drawn, archers ready, willing to strike with deadly force. They're about a day away. The Hebrews have no chance to outrun them. You know, I thought surely Moses' first thought was that a massacre was about to happen. He probably thought that his family, his children, his grandchildren would probably not make it very long. And on top of that, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of his people under his leadership was no doubt going to face the same fate. Plus, Moses knows his troops aren't ready for battle. I mean, they are nothing more than recently freed slaves. No military training at all. I mean, these guys would make Gomer Pyle look like a Navy SEAL. Huh? I mean, he knows that the women, the children are minutes away from freaking out and, and adding to the kind of chaos that makes a surprise attack like this basically even more lethal. So in short, Moses has no time to spare. He turns to the three guys that he trusts. These are three guys that he probably trusts most in crisis. And he gives them crystal clear direction. He says to Joshua, he says, sound the battle cry. Round up as many soldiers as you can. Have the men get anything they can use as weapons. Remember, these were slaves. Tell them to find something they can use as a weapon and head out to meet this enemy. So Joshua takes off to carry out Moses' order. He doesn't pause to think because he's young and full of courage, full of optimism. He has no idea how bad this could all go. And then Moses, who, by the way, is 80 years old. Everybody say 80 years old. He's 80 years old when this crisis occurs. He turns to Aaron, which is his 83-year-old brother. How old is Aaron? How old is Moses? And then he turns to her, 
which is not a woman, but a man, who was Moses' brother-in-law, who was also as old as they were, or older. And he turns to them and says, okay, let's go do what we got to do. So these three old guys who would be good candidates for the local spit and whittle club. Hello. They climb this nearby hill, and they reach the top about the same time Joshua and his ragtag army reach the enemy. So now having reached the hilltop, what's the Bible say they do? Well, do they direct the battle from up there with some ancient version of signal flags? Do they throw rocks down on the enemy? Do they stomp their feet and curse their circumstances? Some might say no. Instead, Moses does what a two-year-old does when standing next to a parent and something startles them makes them feel vulnerable, they put their hands up and they look to their parent and in this case look to God for help. I mean, when Moses and his crew faced this dead-end situation, they instinctively did what all little kids do. You know, I can remember times when my children were frightened and they would come close and reach up their hands. What's it mean, Mom? What's it mean, Dad? Pick me up. Pick me up. Well, in essence, I I see in this text, that's kind of what Moses did. Like a child, he raised his hands to ask for his heavenly father's help. And I mean, Moses saw the bloodthirsty Amalekite army advancing. He knew Joshua was outnumbered and there was no way naturally that militarily he was going to win in spite of his youthful optimism. So Moses made the strategic decision that the best way he could serve his people and the best way he could help them survive a nightmare would be for him to stand on the top of the hill, put his hands up like a two-year-old and say, help God. We need some supernatural help around here. If we don't get some help, we're through. And at this point, I want to remind you of what may well be the single most greatest or single greatest privilege afforded, I'd say, the entire human race throughout all history. And that is the open invitation to turn toward heaven in any circumstances of life and ask our Heavenly Father for help. Turn to your neighbor and say, ask for help like a two-year-old. You know, the sad fact is we are very capable of complicating the whole notion of prayer. With our theological debating over how to pray, when to pray, since God is a sovereign God, why should we pray? Hello. I mean, with all of our debating, we can make prayer come to a standstill like traffic during rush hour. But the simple fact is that when Christ came to earth, he saw thousands of weary people losing their daily battles in life. He basically shook his head and said to them, you should take your nightmares to God. Remember what he said? He said, you should ask. You should seek. And you should knock. You aren't designed to be able to stand alone. That's what Jesus told his people. So why don't you just ask? Why don't you just seek? Why don't you knock? Why don't you seek guidance when you need guidance? Why don't you just knock if you need God to open a door for you? And as I consider all we may face in this present year of 2017, I think it's high time that we as a church should ratchet up our prayers. Is that okay? Oh, I don't know. I I think it's high time that we ratchet up our asking. I think it's high time we ratchet up our seeking and our knocking. 
going back to the text in verse 11, it says that when Moses stood at the hilltop there many centuries ago and Joshua and the army were fighting, it says as long as Moses held his hands up, the, the Israelites won. But whenever he lowered his hands, the enemy prevailed. In other words, the battle was won not because of the might and the strategy of Joshua's troops, but it was won because of the power of God given, I believe, in response to Moses' prayers. The fact is God's word is filled with stories like this one, stories that prove the unimaginable power that is available to people who humble themselves and simply ask for God's help. Here are a few examples. We know Abraham prayed and a nation was born from the bodies of of Abraham and Sarah, two senior citizens. Okay, because of prayer, I'm telling this elderly couple had to stop by the maternity ward, ward on their way to the retirement home. Elijah prayed, and the Bible says it didn't rain for three years. He prayed again, and God sent the refreshing rain. David prayed, and his horrendous sins of lust and murder and uh, adultery were forgiven. Hezekiah prayed, and his life was uh, lengthened by about 15 years, I believe it was. Thinking of stories like these, John Chrysostom, the old, they called him a golden-mouthed orator of many, many years ago. Uh, He said, one of the early church fathers, this way he said, Prayer is the root, the fountain, the mother of a thousand blessings. How many believe that? We must never underestimate the power of prayer because God's unlimited power flows primarily to and through his people because of their praying. His supernatural strength is made available to praying people who take their burdens to him and people who are wise enough to know that God can and will make a difference even in their nightmares of life. Prayer is a powerful weapon. It can change circumstances, and it can change relationships. I can hear, uh, uh, I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, a lot of people look at the church, and they're like, well, they're no better off than we are. Listen, friends, I, I know there's power in prayer because it can heal psychological. It can heal physical problems. It can restore break, uh, bre- broken homes and broken marriages. It can actually provide finances for you when you're in a bind. How many has ever prayed and said, God, I, I need a little help here financially? Listen, it can bring a peace even in the midst of, of panic and prayer can handle any difficulty or uh, dilemma or discouragement. Think of it. God is willing to put himself in the position of taking delight in fulfilling his will through us when we pray. You remember what Jesus told Peter? He said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Do you remember the description of the early church, the first congregation that met there in Jerusalem? The book of Acts tells us that the prayer, prayer is what they did every time they met. Do you see that? Meeting together with other Christians in the days of the early church and not praying was unthinkable. It was unthinkable. Well, I think congregational prayerlessness should be just as unthinkable for us because when two or three or two or three hundred pray together, they experience an unbelievable power of unity through which God can do amazing things. So from the earliest days, the church has always been at its best when its people have knelt together in prayer. And if we want to see the power of God in churches like Broadway Assembly, uh, listen, like he was in the early church, then how many know we ought to pray like they prayed? Because it's an indispensable source of unbelievable power. So if we are to be a powerful church, we must be a prayerful church. All right, now, I want to share with you real quick two observations, not three, just two, about this text and how prayer affects 
the nightmare crisis of our life. First, first point is the position of our hands makes a huge difference. Hello. Did you ever got, did you wonder how long it took for these three guys to make the correlation between the position of Moses' arms and the tide of the battle? Maybe early on, Moses, you know, he's standing there with his hands up in the air, praying for God's help, and then he decides to take a coffee break. Maybe he needs to go check his email. Or he stands up and stretches a bit to loosen his muscles. When Moses does this, Aaron and her notice, oh, something's going on down there. The battle starts to go the way of the Amalekites. Then when Moses is done with his break, he goes back and lifts his hands in prayer again. And the three of them notice, hmm, the battle is swung back to Israel's favor. They think, hmm, is that a coincidence? So when lunchtime comes around, maybe Aaron suggests to Moses, hey, don't take too long chowing down. Because I think there might be a connection between your prayers and how this battle is going. I'm not for sure, but I'm just saying. Sure enough, when Moses lowers his hands and sits down to eat lunch, the battle turns and the enemy begins to prevail. So maybe he skips dessert and begins lifting his hands and prays real quick. Again. And sure enough, the Hebrews begin to prevail again. And so now all of them realize the result of the battle is directly correlated with the location of Moses' hands. When they're up, when he's praying, Israel's prevailing. When they're down, when he stops asking God for help, the enemy prevails. It's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Listen, on so many different levels, the tide of our life's battles and our church's battles hinges on the location of our hands. Hello, church. Now, physiologically, and dif uh, the differential of raised hands and lowered hands is not all that impressive. My raised hands reach a little bit more than eight feet in the air. I measured them this week. Eight feet and three inches to be exact. This means that if I could just jump two feet, I could dunk a basketball. I don't think it's going to happen. My lowered hands hang 30 inches from the ground. It's a difference now of 69 inches. That may not sound all that monumental. It's only 69 inches. But I can testify to the fact that the entire way I experience life on a day-to-day, week-by-week, month-to-month basis is affected by the location of my hands. Hello, church. Hmm? Those 69 inches make a tremendous difference in the tide of the battles of my life and the quality of my life. I've learned the hard way that when my hands are raised and I am praying fervently and expectantly, there is a richness in my relationship with God. There is a sense of His presence. There is a sense of His power. I have learned that when my hands are raised, when, when, when God and I are talking, the general tide of the battles in my life go God's way. Hello? In spite of the circumstances, can you remember a time when you learned the importance of keeping your hands up to God? Hello, maybe it was when you were doing a, a job interview and, and you put your hands up on the way to the interview and you said, oh God, please help me. Maybe you're a stay-at-home parent and there was a time when the kids were driving you crazy and you said, oh God, please help me. 
Listen, all kidding aside, do you remember times in your life when you, when having your hands up to God and praying without ceasing, you noticed a richness uh, in your relationship with God and it was obvious as night and day. Uh, one writer said, no man is stronger than when he leans on God. Listen, and that is so true because God is all powerful and he welcomes us leaning on him. He loves it when we raise our hands to him like a helpless child and say, God, I need some help right now. This week I read that when you send a letter to the president, uh, it, it first passes through what's called the Office of Presidential Correspondence. This office was founded under President McKinley in 1897 to help his administration address the roughly 100, 100, they said, letters arriving to him every day. By the time Herbert Hoover was president, the office would receive around 800 letters a day. Today, the president of the U.S. gets 65,000 letters a week, plus thousands of parcels and emails every single day. Those who write in, a lot of times they... They know the president himself is not likely going to see their letter. And a lot of them don't think anybody's going to read their letter. Many of them, when they write, they start their letter with this phrase, I know no one will read this. But they're wrong. Someone does read their letters. Many times that person is Fiona Reeves director of the presidential correspondence at the White House. She and a group of 45 staffers, 35 interns, and 300 rotating volunteers read thousands of letters sent to the president. During one former president's time in office, he specifically requested to receive 10 letters to read every night before he went to bed. Before letters arrive at the Office of Presidential Correspondence, the Secret Service opens and inspects them, and after being screened, the paper letters are clipped to the envelopes uh, they, they arrived in. Then it is up to the staff and the interns and the volunteers to dig through the letters and the emails and figure out which ones to pass on up the chain to Fiona Reeves, who personally reads 300 letters a day. After Fiona Reeves choose, or chose, in, in the example of the former president, she would choose 10 letters for the former president, and she would hand them off to someone who would then put them together uh, in what was called the presidential nightly briefing book. Now, I, I read that, and I just thought, this is pretty impressive that a president would choose to take time from his busy schedule to read 10 letters a night, and, and they said, actually, he would respond mostly handwritten notes and respond back to them. And I thought, you know, that, that, was, that was pretty impressive. But then I thought, infinitely more impressive is that God listens to each and every prayer that we ever pray. There is not, to my knowledge, an angelic version of Fiona Reeves' staff filtering them when they come to heaven, deciding which ones to forward on to God. No, God hears and responds to every prayer. And when we have our hands up, when we are in that attitude of asking for our Heavenly Father's help, we experience the incredible benefit of God's power to His people. On the other hand, I can think of many times in my life when my hands were at my sides. Hello? When this happened, the tide of my life's battle started to turn and go the other way. Hello, is this okay? Uh, anybody connect with this thought? I mean, after seeing the result I, I, of my hands being down and, and my life's battle starting to go the bad way, I, I, I come to my senses and I say, Ooh, what's happening here? Uh, I don't like the man I'm becoming. Why did I act like that? And I, I, I check the location of my hands. And I realize that when my hands are down, I'm in my do-it-myself mode. I've stopped praying 
And I've stopped asking God for his help, for his insight, for his power. And this begs the question, why? If prayer is raised hands, and if prayer and raised hands can positively change the tide of, of life's battles, why would we ever lower them? For Moses in our text, we see the, the why was physical fatigue. Is that, did I say that right? Fatigue. Exodus 17, 12 speaks directly to this. It talks about Moses' hands growing tired. I mean, even though great things happened when his hands were raised, Moses was still a human being. He was an 80-year-old normal guy. His hands grew tired and they eventually fell to his side. Well, every honest Christ follower can describe at least one season of prayerlessness in your life. I have. Hello. There's been times that I've grew tired of asking God in prayer. I mean, prayer is a discipline. It takes energy. It takes time. And I will confess that there have been times when I have become undisciplined in prayer. Am I the only one? Hello. Do I need to turn in my pastor's badge? Huh? I hope not because I'm human just like you. And I'm sure many of you have put your hands down for one reason or another. Maybe you had your heart disappointed in one area of life. And, and again and again and again, you prayed for weeks and months and years and decades maybe. And then there came this point where you just said, my hands are tired. I can't pray for this anymore. Or I've prayed for this spouse of mine and prayed that they would listen to the gospel, but, but they're not. I'm just getting tired. Or we've, we've had it so hard financially in spite of my prayers, I'm just going to give up for a while. I mean, listen, you didn't abandon your basic beliefs in the Christian faith or you didn't abandon your belief that God is good. You simply lowered your hands to your side and you're like, I'm going to just stay in acceptance mode. Hello? I'm not going to ask God to do anything anymore for a while. Okay, let's get back to the hilltop here and see what happened to Moses when his hands grew tired. Verse 12 says, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put under him so he could be seated. And then they got under. Listen, this leads to my second thought and final thought that I want to leave you with this morning. Not only does the position of your hands make a difference when those nightmares come, but the position of your clothes closest friends' hands make a difference when your nightmares come. Listen, sometimes you just need some spiritual backup. Oh, help me, I feel like preaching right there. Listen, when Moses grew weary, his 83-year-old brother and even his older brother-in-law, they began to say, oh, we got to do something about this. I need some folks that realize, hey, we're going to do something about this battle that we're losing. And then they, they begin to think and they said, okay, Moses is getting tired. Well, he needs to sit down. So they found this rock and they began to roll it over. And they said, here, Moses, sit down. Hallelujah. And then they said, okay, Moses, we got to find a way to prop your hands up. We got to keep you praying, basically. And so one of them crawled up under this arm, and one of them crawled up under this arm, and they said, Hey, ah, uh, oh, isn't that a powerful picture? Uh, listen, these two old guys said to Moses, uh, We know you're running out of steam, bro. Uh, we're here, and we're going to kind of fuel you up and, and hold you up, and we're not in this battle alone. We're going to help each other out. Uh, well, you stay here, Moses. You sit here as long as you need to, and we're going to stay here as long as you're here and we're going to hold your hands up. Praise God. I can't help but think of Christ in the garden of Gethsemane when feeling the overwhelming weight of the redemptive work that he was about to go through. His arms started to go down. You remember that? He went off, the Bible says, to the side to pray and he took Peter, James, and John and he said, hey guys, can you not pray with me one hour? I need some backup, boys. 
I need somebody to hold my arms up. But the Bible says no, they would fall asleep. Listen, we have never forgot that burdens or that prayer burdens often require some burden bearers. Listen, we need some burden bearers. Every Christ follower eventually learns that when your arms get tired and you get weak, listen, and you can't pray anymore, you got to humbly reach out to some brothers and sisters and say, hey, can you hold my arms up a little bit? Can you... I'm getting tired of asking. I'm getting tired of praying. I need some support. Would you just pray for me? Listen, when you feel the errands and the hers of your life supporting you, when you feel them transfer some of their faith into your tank, It's an unforgettable experience. It's Christian community at its best. Hello. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? I said, does anybody in here know what I'm talking about? Listen, you have a couple errands and hers. I trust you do that you can count on. Now, do you have the humility to ask them, I need some help. Can you help hold up my arms? Maybe you know a Moses whose arms is aching. Do you know somebody in your circle of acquaintances who's carrying a heavy burden right now? And maybe you know their arms are getting tired. Can you go to that person and say, I know the burden you're carrying. Let a couple of us get under your arms and hold you up for a while. Listen, church, that's what the church should do to each other. Sometimes we all go through times when we're weak and discouraged. It is in those times we need other believers. I said it's in those times we need other Pentecostal believers to encourage us. Keep on praying, brother. Keep on praying, sister. And when you can't pray, I'm going to be praying with you. I'm going to be praying for you. Listen, and the tide of our life's battles will hinge on the location of our hands. Somebody raise your hands right now all across this building and say, God, I need your help. Woo. 69 inches for me is the difference between... I'll just do it myself. Or I need your help, God. Exodus 17, 13, as the musicians come, it reveals miraculously, guess what? Joshua and his ragtag army overcame Somebody say, praise God. Look at this victory. It was an overwhelming victory against all odds. Why? Why could they why could they win? How did it happen? Because somebody prayed and somebody kept praying, and a few old men got together and supported each other. This is where God calls each of us to live. Like the Hebrews, church, we're in a wilderness. Huh? Oh, but God is with us. And if we'll pray, He'll help us fight our battles. I said, and He'll help us win. The Apostle Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? But we must take up our spiritual weapon of prayer and lean on each other if we have to. When prayer becomes burdensome, we can lean on each other because together we can live through the nightmares of our lives. 
through the nightmares, we're going to come out on the other side with, with dreams of what God will still accomplish in our families or in our church. And when the battle gets too big for us, we must declare like David of old when he said, this battle is not mine, it belongs to the Lord. And in Him there is victory and He will get all the glory as we get the benefits of prayer that actually prevailed. Somebody say thank Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I still believe in prayer. Oh, stand with me. I'm closing. Is anybody in here still believe in prayer, church? Let me ask you this morning. I'm going to do things a little different. Is that okay? I felt directly to ask for those if you're going through a situation in your life, in your family right now, that you would say, Pastor, I'm in a desperate situation and I need some prayer. What we're going to do is we're going to ask you to come forward. We just want you to stand across this front. If it's a brother, I want two brothers to just, hey, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna visualize this. Okay? Is that okay? We're going to illustrate this. We're going to visualize it. I want two brothers. If a brother comes forward, I want two brothers, one on the right, one on the left, just kind of get under their arms and support their arms. And I want us to pray together like that. If it's a sister that comes and stands, I want a couple sisters, just one on each side, just kind of get under their arms and just say, hey, we're going to support you through this. And we're going to pray a prayer collectively together. All right? Is that okay? Is that okay? All right. All right. All right. All right, I'm opening these altars. Anybody, anybody that would say, I'm going through a situation. You don't need to tell us anybody. You don't need to tell anybody what your situation is. You can if you want. Obviously, that's your business. But, but we're not here to find out any details. We're here to help you pray. Is that okay? All right, all right. I'm opening these altars. Somebody that needs a little help praying for a situation in your life. Would you come forward? Anybody? Is there anybody? There's one over here. All right. Anybody else? Here's some more. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, there's a brother over here. Can I have a couple brothers? There's a sister here. Can we have a couple sisters? Okay, these are, these are those that's going through situations. Praise God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else that wants prayer? Anybody else? Anybody else? There's a brother over here. A couple brothers come and support. Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's right. I feel the presence of God. I feel the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's it. Anybody else? Hey, this is this is just totally unvarnished. You just I know you're saying I don't want to go up there. I don't want to let people know I'm going through something. Listen, folks, who really cares? God cares. We're here to help you. We're here to pray. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Here's Kevin. Kevin's mom prayed for salvation last Sunday. Oh, that never gets old. I need a couple brothers. Come and pray for Kevin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost. That's it, sisters. That's it, brothers. Now, raise your hands. Raise your hands. And let's pray. That's it. Raise your hands and let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name. Our hands are raised all across this place. Hey, folks out in the congregation, would you raise your hands and let's all just make it 100% participation. If you're not able to raise your hands, we understand nobody's looking. Okay, but, but I want us to just get as much hands up in the air as we possibly can. This means we're praying. This means we're binding together. That's it, brothers. That's it, sisters. In the name of Jesus. God, there's battles. There's nightmares that's been fought right here in the last few days. There's brothers and sisters right here this morning across the front. God, that's living in the battle of their life. I'm asking you, oh God, don't let them leave without giving them some strength this morning don't let them leave without filling their faith tank with a little bit of your presence and your power as a sister prays for sisters as brothers pray for brothers Lord we're going to draw strength from each other and we're going to trust you we're going to trust you that's it tell the Lord you trust him today tell the Lord you trust him today Woo! thank you Jesus thank you Jesus that's it Moses there's an Aaron and a her. 
on either side of you and we're going to support you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to strengthen you. Believe God. Trust Him right now. He may not fix it this morning, but you're going to leave knowing that there's some supporters in prayer with you. Yes, one on the right, one on the left. And we're going to pray with you and believe God. We'll strengthen you and carry you through this battle. That's right, victory. Oh, go ahead and claim victory. Go ahead and claim victory. Tell the one in the left or one on your right, we're going to walk out of here with victory. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. He's all that you need. There's power in prayer. He's the God that won't fail when friends let you down. So cast all your care on him, cause I found he'll take a heartache, he'll turn it around. There's power in prayer, oh, there's power in prayer. If you'll believe, he's standing right there for you to receive. For the problems you face, he's all that you need. There's power in prayer. He's the God that won't fail when friends let you down. So cast all your cares on Him, cause I found He'll take a heartache and turn it around. There's power. 